All right, Doug, we are back with, well, some news items to talk about and some questions from members of the file. And uh, I did make a commercial endorsement of something we have going on. And the last one, I'm going to do it again. We have a new uh, free report on uranium, uh, kind of a once in a decade opportunity to invest. It's available for free. If you go to crisisinvesting.com, you'll see a little link at the top. You can sign up for the free report there. So, Doug, what's going on in Encyclopedia Britannica? Well, this is a big day, April 19th, believe it or not. I was rather surprised that so many things have uh, happened in history. Like, for instance, uh, it was this day in 1775 that the U.S. Revolutionary War started with the battles of Lexington and Concord. And um, I guess the last time, didn't we mention this excellent essay that, uh, that Chris, Chris Webber did? We did, yeah. and we got Chris's permission to republish it on crisis investing. I definitely encourage everybody to go read it. It's excellent. Yeah, so uh, because the uh, U.S. Revolution, American Revolutionary War was really nothing like what most people think it was, but it started today with Lexington and Concord. It started officially. It had been building up for quite some time before that. Also, another big thing happened today. In 1882, uh, Charles Darwin died at age uh, 73. And that's kind of a big deal because uh, his writings reinterpreted the actual nature of life. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, really gigantic, uh, Darwin. So <clears throat> that's another thing. Uh, a third thing. Well, this isn't very important, but it's kind of interesting. Uh, it was uh, this day in 2018 that uh, uh, King M. Swati, the uh, king of Swaziland, unilaterally changed the name of Swaziland to Eswatini. Now, hmm. Swaziland or Eswatini uh, is a uh, landlocked country and totally surrounded by South Africa. And... Um, I think it's interesting that there's still countries that have absolute rulers, kings, that can arbitrarily change the name of a country. And normally, <clears throat> when they change the name of a country, it's a bad sign. Like when Mobutu changed the name of the Congo to Zaire, uh, it wasn't good. And like when these idiots that run uh, Burma changed its name to, uh, what the hell is the new name of Burma? Myanmar. Myanmar. You know, this is always telling you that they want to upset everything and just change. It, it, it's like when the Jacobins changed the months of the year, gave them new everything. So, but I guess that's not the case in the case of Eswatini. He just feels that we ought to use the native word as opposed to an English word. Okay, that's not so dramatic, but still. Uh, worth mentioning. Also, it was this day in 1993 that uh, the Branch Davidians were barbecued. Oh, wow. Yeah. This, that was, this was the day. So this, uh, that really is a major thing where it was a, a sham attack, totally unnecessary attack on this religious community, such as it is, and uh, for no reason, I mean, the sheriff could have knocked on the door and if they had some problem with the, uh, uh, are there illegal guns here? They would have been, it would have been no problem. But no, they don't do it that way. Instead, the, the uh, which agency is that? The gun agency, you got there's so many of them. ATF. ATF, right. I hate having to remember all these <laughs> sort of names. Uh, letter symbols, you know, it launched an attack on it and then it got out of control and it still could have been confused, but they wound up actually burning down a building with 80 people in it. That was criminal. It was really a lot of criminal. children. A lot of a lot children. Of children. It, it was completely pointless criminal on the part of the U.S. government. And then two years later, exactly, uh, we had the Oklahoma City bought it, bombing where 168 people died and uh, it says 500 people were 
were injured. And uh, to this day, we still don't really know what happened at that building where certain federal, federal agencies, it was a government building, kind of were quietly evacuated. And so who really knows? And then they executed Timothy McVeigh. So whatever secrets he may or may not have had died with him. So it's all very suspicious. Seems it's very to suspicious. Me. And the, the, I can't remember the name of the, the movie um, about Waco that I saw. Just maybe five or six years ago it came out. And it was it was really good. I mean, it was a very fair portrayal of what was you know where where it, it did portray the branch davidians in a fair light and i thought and a, a lot of people are completely unaware of that event even happening i mean it was one it's one of the first ones as a because i was a you know was, i guess i was 18 when it happened so i remember watching on cnn live you know as they like roll our car up and dump the cs gas into the building and everything and it was just terrible to watch it like that. And I was still under the impression that the narrative was that these were bad people who were doing bad things. And, you know, he was doing terrible things to kids in there. And I mean, whatever the narrative they were, they were spinning about it at the time. But um, a lot of people are just totally unaware unaware of that whole event. There's a guy who, who's, who moved down here and he lived in Waco. Uh, for a little while. And I said, Oh, yeah, Waco. Yeah, that's, man. Uh, and, and it was some, and he, he was talking about actually some Christian community in Waco that he had he visited. And I said, Oh, so like the Branch Davidians, he didn't know who I was talking about. He's, yeah. he's, he's like 32 years old, he had no knowledge of this event even occurring at all, which, and it was, I mean, it's such a travesty, really, it's just so wrong, everything that happened there. Yeah, and of course, the victors write the history. So, you know, uh, what was that chap's name that ran the Branch Davidians? It was... Uh, David Koresh. David Koresh. So he has these weird religious ideas, but probably no more weird than the uh, ultra-Orthodox Jews have, or for that matter, uh, the, the Mohammedans have, all these... Religious organizations have all kinds of outre ideas. There's no reason to barbecue them pointlessly. And, and then cover it up so that, oh, it was fine to do that because we're the U.S. government and we're all for truth, justice in the American way, which is and actually- And if you recall, one of the guys involved in that, maybe it was like the scene commander or something that they tried to point, appoint him as head of the ATF two years ago. The guy who was involved in it, you know, they wanted to make it, they wanted to give him, they wanted to appoint him as the head of it. And he was going through congressional hearings and there were enough people there that remembered his involvement with it, that thankfully he did not get the promotion. But Jesus, I mean, it's like, if you participate in these things, you, you get moved up the ladder. Yeah. And it doesn't matter what type of uh, criminal incompetence that government agents engage in, they can generally skate like there was an agent, uh, a Delta Force agent, and they are absolutely the most highly trained members of the U.S. military. I mean, these guys are really super professionals. Uh, and uh, uh, he's the one that shot, uh, who was that woman? Uh, they were living out in the woods, not bothering anybody. Uh, Randy Weaver? Yeah, Randy Weaver and his wife, Vicky. Yeah. So... Uh, he shot her and her baby. This is not a mistake. Now, this is this is this is actually criminal malfeasance. He should have been prosecuted and jailed for a long, long time for that. And he was back at Waco after this happened. So, you know, these these people get away with murder. Just, murder, exactly. So they're very, very dangerous people. Uh, okay, so Branch Davidians, Oklahoma City bombing. Uh, and on the bright side, though, uh, today in 1927, uh, May West was jailed for 10 days uh, for um, actually the technical crime was corrupting the youth. Same thing they accused Socrates of. 
uh, 10 Days for a, a play she wrote. It was being performed on Broadway. Uh, she wrote and directed and starred in called Sex. And uh, uh, it's a good thing they put her in jail because she became a national phenomenon due to the, not, not due to the play, but because of the fact they jailed her. So these people really are stupid. Uh, what they do is counterproductive to what they say they want to do. They're, they're just small, vindictive people. Anyway, I'm mm -hmm. a fan of Midwest, but it's unbelievable that that was almost a hundred years ago that Mae West was on the scene. Amazing. Wow. Time flies. Anyway, well, that's what Encyclopedia Britannica uh, tells us happened today. Well, okay. Well, of well, interest. well, let's get to some of these questions. And then um, well, there's a couple of news items that are definitely worth addressing. So um, we'll uh, see how far we get here. So first question is, what's your take on Eric Prince? Well, I've always been a fan of private armies and mercenaries, frankly. Uh, they're entrepreneurs that can do things that, uh, I mean, if you're going to have an army, uh, it, it really should be uh, run for profit with voluntary recruits and um, better than a state-sponsored army who get into a lot more trouble. But I don't know what Prince is doing today since he... he uh, did he sell or rename or what did he do with Blackwater? They they rebranded it. And then I think he was ousted from the company after that. And then he tried, he started to reemerge and doing some work on the, with the Trump administration. I think it's his sister was the secretary of education. That's right. And then, um, and then, you know, once, once Trump was gone, he's definitely fallen out of favor again. So I'm not sure what he's doing these days. I don't know much about Prince except from what I hear about him. He seems like he would be a a, a lot of fun to have a drink and a cigar with sometime. Probably, probably. Okay, uh, Doug, do you do you actually hold passports in in countries other than the U.S.? Well, I don't want to go into my personal situation, except to say that. Uh, Everybody, uh, especially Americans and Canadians at this point, should have uh, a backup document. As a matter of fact, if you're an American, you should seriously consider renouncing your citizenship so that you're not under the purview of the U.S. government, paying taxes to it. Even if you never set foot back in the U.S., again, you're still going to have to fill out lots and lots of reporting forms in addition to uh, paying taxes. So actually it can go beyond uh, just uh, having a second citizenship. Yeah, you know, I, I was really happy to hear last week, Max said to me for the first time, you know, he's not eligible here in Uruguay for another like, you know, two and a quarter years or so. But he's like, yeah, I, I think I'd like to renounce when I get mine. Yeah, because as he grows up, the whole world is going to be very, very different. Uh, and anyway, a, a U.S. passport used to be worth having. It used to be a desirable thing to have, but not anymore. It's an actual albatross around your neck. It's a disadvantage to, to have it. Yeah, you get visa-free travel to a lot of countries, but uh, the fact that you're American automatically, reflexively, makes a lot of people want to kill you because they think that you represent the terrible things that the U.S. government does. So, yeah, there's a lot to that. I think the, the you know, the visa fee travel thing is definitely diminishing. During COVID, it was not a great password to, passport to have at all. And I think that the EU now requires you to have a visa. Yes, um, they do. That's, uh, yes, they do. And, and they charge, I, I, I think the fee is like, $60 or something like that in order to get a, a visa for the uh, plus, plus all your biometrics, I think, part of the process. Yeah. Yeah, it's too bad. The United States is very different from what America used to be. In fact, it's become antithetical. It, it, it's actually shameful, shocking, disgusting. 
It's not America. It's these wow. United States. It's these United States or the United States now. Yeah. Okay. Uh, next question is, uh, what does Doug think about a potential population collapse? Elon Musk has said it is one of the greatest threats to humanity, and Russell Clark, an investor, thinks that government should start paying people to have children. Well, I'm generally speaking a fan of Elon for all kinds of reasons, and I think he's right also. Um, this other chap, whoever he is, the government should do this. The government should do that. The government should pay people to have babies. No, the government should pay people not. You know, all these people have all these opinions and they want to get the, so I'm on Elon's side. He says people ought to have kids. Okay, that's great. Uh, but this other chap, whoever he is, uh, uh, you got an opinion. And, and the reason you know it's a stupid opinion is that he says the government should do this, should pay some people for doing something at, at the expense of everybody else. Uh, what's going to happen? I guess that's really at the nub of the question. Well, let me see. Are we going to have a, uh, a purge? Uh, that could happen. Or are we going to have a um, some type of a cleansing type of thing that uh, these people like... Uh, all these billionaires that go to the EW World Economic Forum uh, talk about you know, get rid of all these hoi polloi, get rid of all these the useless eaters. Useless eaters, right. Uh, when in fact, they're actually, they're not the elite, they're the parasites. And not that the world isn't full of useless eaters that are living on welfare and uh, have to have food shipped to them and be, yes, those are useless eaters. But Actually, they're the more dangerous, useless eaters. These people at the, uh, the, the that go to the WEF and similar type organizations all around right. the world. And I think you make an argument that the useless leaders is a is like an effect created by the cause of government. You know that they the incentives are structured in such a way that a whole class of people are encouraged to become useless. Government has made it possible for parasites to live. You would not have all these parasites on the human race if it wasn't for the institution of government. People don't understand that their real enemy is the state, the institution itself. Great, okay. Uh, Doug, do you think that getting a German passport might be worth it for a US citizen who's currently living in Germany considering that Germany is never going to stand up uh, for one of their citizens against the will of the U.S. You know, I don't know what their current laws are in Germany, but I've always understood that it was quite hard to become a German citizen. Now, what they're going to do with the millions of uh, migrants that, uh, who was that, that silly bitch that was the uh, the prime minister or president, whatever, for so many Angela years. Angela Merkel. Angela Merkel, right. Uh, so all those uh, several million people that she invited into the country, are they going to become Germans? I don't know. But uh, one thing I'm pretty sure of from talking to German friends is that uh, Germany does not allow you to have two passports. Mm. Not to say you can't get another passport, but if the Germans find out about it, they'll punish you and take away your German passport. So um, I don't think Germany's the uh, the best uh, candidate for a second passport or even a primary one for that matter. Mm, makes sense. Okay, uh, next question. The mainstream media is are talking about cloud seeding possibly being responsible for the Dubai flash floods, all while they dismiss weather modification in the West as a conspiracy theory. What are the chances that sometime in the future it is disclosed that Western governments have indeed been carrying out weather modification experiments? Could the open media discussion be about introducing regulations to normalize the practice in public? Well, you know, this is something that uh, uh, little people like ourselves, we're not privy uh, to what the uh, these government agencies are doing. National security. Of course, right. but uh, I wouldn't doubt that they're playing with that. 
are they actually experimenting places? I we don't know, do we? Well, I do. I do know there was announced something recently where they were doing some experiments off of a um, an old uh, um, aircraft carrier in San Francisco, a decommissioned aircraft carrier, and that was on the it was on the news. This was just like two weeks ago where they they shared that they were doing this experiment in uh, in San Francisco. And I and I do know that there are there's a guy I follow uh, I watch some of his stuff sometimes on YouTube where he's a he like tracks the movement of aircraft he's that's what he did in the military and so he does these you know showing how many C-130s are going to place where the drones are that have their transponders on and everything and there are companies that are called that have names like Weather Modification Inc. <laughs> you know and you can see their planes up and he he he'll point them out you know that they're um, when they're in the air, the transponder's on. So maybe they don't do weather modification, but that's the name of the company that the plane is chartered under. I don't know. So I, I think they're definitely experimenting. Listen, I remember when I was a kid and I used to love Donald Duck, but especially Uncle Scrooge comics. And I remember one scheme that Donald Duck got involved in where he was going to be a crop, not a crop duster, but a cloud seeder uh, mm -hmm. where um, you dropped... Um, Silver iodide, I believe, is the chemical on the on clouds to make them rain. And uh, I remember that from so weather modification has has, has been a me not new ever since the early fifties with Donald Duck. Right, exactly. So this is it's hard to imagine that they that there hadn't been lots of innovation and experimentation on it, you know, over the last seventy years. I mean, hard to imagine. I'm I'm sure there there are some crazy scientists that may or may not have actual evil intent that are playing around with stuff like this, and maybe they'll succeed. Don't know. Well, they certainly. I don't know if you saw any of the videos of the floods in Dubai. They got like six years of rain in one day, and it was yeah. unbelievable. Dubai is a place that can use some rain, but not all at once. <laughs> Yeah, it's like a, the guy mixing the uh, the chemicals or whatever. He was a little was drunk or not paying attention. Yeah, the saucer is a practice. Exactly. Exactly yeah. right. <laughs> Who knows? All right. Uh, next question: How is Doug protecting himself against a potential great taking? Well, if you have a bank account and or a stock account. There's not much you can do. I mean, what are you going to do? Because the great taking is supposed to be legal when they when they do it. So the best thing you can do is uh, own a lot of gold and silver coins, uh, own things that are not directly in the financial system. I mean, valuable artwork, valuable collectibles, real estate. That's an important thing to own uh, and diversify internationally because it's mainly, I suspect, going to be the uh, advanced Western countries that are going to uh, get taken to school. So you're better off in a place that's a little bit of a backwater. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Uh, let's see. Next question. Given the immigrant invader, sorry, immigrant invader madness. What general societal norm do you see being the first breakdown in the states or comparative to elsewhere where the world economic foreign driven policies are driving the migration? Uh, do you have a view uh, to a domino effect impact? Like, is there, where would we see it first? I guess the, is, is the question. With the migrants? Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, is there, he says, what general societal norm do you both see being the first to break down in the States? In the States? Well, I think everything is more unstable in Europe than it is in the States to start with, because their problem is uh, Muslim uh, migrants. And as, as a group, the Mohammedans are much, much more problematical than the people that are piling into the U.S. across the Rio Grande. 
um, the Europeans, their actual whole culture is going to be washed away if they don't watch it. I mean, it's quite a problem. Uh, as far as the people that are coming across the southern border, they're not mainly Mohammedans, although we're getting plenty of them too. Uh, look, this is a real problem. It wouldn't be a problem unless these stupid governments actually subsidized uh, people from an alien cultures, alien language, alien religion, alien everything, uh, coming in upsetting people just living their normal lives. That's the problem. So the problem is the welfare and the actual benefits that you give to draw these people in, which draws in not the best, in the, it draws in the worst kind of people that are looking for freebies. Yeah, so, actually, I've got I've got a little clip. Let me just play this real quick, Doug, uh, because this one, just real quick, that illustrates this point extremely well. This is from a, uh, a New York uh, City Council meeting. There are unique dialects that are also coming that I've never heard of that I'm learning now um, about people from Madagascar coming. You have people of uh, Burundi are coming people from countries that are not common to us. Uh, so language access has been truly, truly a challenge, especially if you don't understand. Polar from Guinea and Polar in Mauritania, Polar in Senegal is very different. So thank you because we have to push for language access because I have seen it, people telling me even to stay in the shelter, to wherever in the herd they cannot stay because when they ask them to um, reapply, they're not getting it. And so thank you for continuing the work. I do want to add on one thing. There is a, a, a significant amount of people who are illiterate. So written does not work. We have been sending voice clips to the migrants, explaining to them what their rights are and to understand what's going on. So it's not just written. We need vocals. Thank you. So they're illiterate in their own language as well. That's right. <laughs> They're illiterate, they're unskilled, and they have to be supported. Don't speak the language, can't read or write. I mean, this is absolutely insane. And these people are being flown into the US and supported once they get here. And once they get here, they whine and complain that they want more. And you'll notice that that woman was wearing a hijab uh, so that, you know, before you know it, there's going to be mosques with muezzins calling the faithful to prayer all over New York, the way they are in London and Paris these days. Now, this is this is really, really just uh, a bad thing. When, when will the Americans revolt? Well, interestingly, there's a movie out now. I haven't seen it while we're here in South America called Civil War, which I understand is actually a pretty good movie. And when uh, a popular movie is made talking about the coming civil war in the US, yeah, I think that's pretty predictive. We're gonna have something that resembles a civil war. And mm -hmm. as we were talking about the last time, the next civil war is gonna be like what happened during the American Revolution, not the type of thing that happened from 1861 to 65, yes. which was a civil war, it was a war of secession, but we've covered that before. Okay. All right. Uh, talking let's about, but talking about stupid women, we were before we, we went on air, you were mentioning Janet Yellen and something that she said. Yeah. So Janet Yellen uh, went to China recently, and you know, the trade war ideas at least are starting to take hold. And I think maybe inspired by their success with Russia, I'm not sure. But um, this is a quote from her. Uh, she says, China is now simply too large for the rest of the world to absorb this enormous capacity. And when the global market is flooded by artificially cheap Chinese products, the viability of American and other foreign firms is put into question. You know, she, that's a really stupid statement. I want to believe that she's really stupid. Uh, I, and I've said for years, she, she really should be slicing prestromity in back of a, a deli counter. It, it kind of looks like that. That suits her. But uh, 
fluttered with artificially cheap things. Now, that's an idiotic statement. I mean, her, the meme she's putting forward is evil and destructive, but it's stupid. Artificially cheap, flooding the world. Uh, you don't do things unless it's profitable. And if it's profitable, it's not artificially cheap. And the reason that the Chinese are outcompeting the West is because the Chinese, in point of fact, have less taxes, less regulations, less, you know, a, a so called communist, which it's not, state. Uh, an entrepreneur can be a lot more productive, a lot easier in China than he can in the US at this point. So they can't, be, they shouldn't be stopped. They should be encouraged for making cheap stuff and creating wealth. The problem lies not in the stars, but with ourselves. It's impossible to do these things in the US. The Chinese can build a nuclear power plant for a couple billion dollars in the US. It takes many, many years and $12 billion. It's the and it's all getting, and it's all, and, and the Chinese economy is getting more productive by the day, by the day. So they can now produce a an electric car for half of what an ICE engine, a normal internal combustion engine car, uh, is produced for, half in the U.S. And it's and it once was really crappy quality, but just like how I remember up, remember growing up, the Japanese was bad. Yep. quality and then korean was bad quality and yep. then no longer you know, you know that they they move way beyond that and i think that people's perception of chinese quality is going to fundamentally change the new cars that they have coming out i was just you know i was just studying this recently is that they can produce a high quality ev car high quality that can compete very effectively with the Tesla in terms of it, the Tesla Model 3 in terms of its specs and performance and all of that. And they can do it at a third of the cost of that. And there are other cars that they can, you know, I mean, you can, you can get a, a serviceable car EV for 10 grand, like something that is decent. Now, what, what car in the United States can you buy for even 20 grand now? It's just, they're not available. So instead, no, no, they, everybody wants to set up, these tariffs to keep these artificially cheap Chinese EVs out of the market to protect, you know, GM or whoever. And it, and so instead of being able to buy a $20,000 car, Chinese, very fine, you know, no problem with it. You'll have to buy a $40,000 car from an American brand. I mean, it's, it's, it's so destructive for people. I mean, cars are so outrageously expensive in the U S now, most people can't afford them. The U.S. government is reducing the standard of living of the American people by making it impossible for them to buy a better, cheaper car from China. And the U.S. government is reducing the standard of living of the American people by making it impossible for Americans to build a car as cheap as, as, as the Chinese. It's, 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 it, everything is just upside down and backwards. And in addition to that, it's going to get us heading towards a war with China, looking at them as not friendly traders, but our enemy. Exactly. And they just, and, and just last, early this week, FBI Director Christopher Wray, you know, the trust for, trustworthy head of the FBI, uh, has announced that Chinese government-linked hackers have infiltrated U.S. critical infrastructure. As they say China is developing the, the capability to cause significant damage to our critical infrastructure at a time of their choosing, waiting for the opportune moment to deal a devastating blow. An ongoing Chinese hacking campaign known as Volt Typhoon has successfully ex accessed numerous American companies in telecommunications, energy, water, and other critical sectors, and with 23 pipeline operators being targeted. That's what he said. That was his statement. Well, I suppose that... Uh... Since the U.S. is plumping for a war with China, China should, uh, you know, asymmetrically try to counter what the U.S. is. is yeah, uh, well, totally. And, and if I were if I were them, I would do the same. But the question is, did they do the same? We just have to rely on this guy of all people to tell us what they've done with such specificity. You know, but they can't stop it either. They can't know stop that it. It, they can't stop it. 
That's right. And he's a very untrustworthy source. Who knows why he's saying these things? What kind of chaos he's trying to create to make the FBI and, and, and his position more important? Uh, well, you, to, you also recall he, he, he specifically has testified multiple times that the greatest threat to the homeland is the white supremacist extremist you know, camp. Yeah, he's clearly a reliable source. But, uh, you know, you, you push people and you antagonize people and you try to destroy them indirectly through your tariffs and all this type of thing. Yeah, you can expect they're going to push back. So, Yeah, it's a disaster, these people. Our leadership. Uh, Our leadership right. Who are okay. these people? <laughs> Somebody like Janet Yellen has become one of the most powerful people in the world. And I don't know if she's more evil or stupid with with the things that she just just said. Uh, got to well, stop. I mentioned, right? Talking about inflation I mean, being transient, that our debt wouldn't be a problem. I mean, all these yeah. nonsense, she says. Got to stop those Chinese from, from flooding the world with cheap products that everybody wants to buy. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know it's crazy. Well, I mean, they do, you know, they are nanny staters. They do believe we don't know what's in our own best interest. So they got to, they got to help us out. That's right. In, in, until they cleanse and purge uh, humanity. In the meantime, well, keep these clubs alive in their cubicles where they'll own nothing and be kind of happy because they're all on psychiatric drugs anyway. Exactly. That seems like that's the goal. Okay, well, let me just do a couple other questions, Doug, and we'll wrap up. It says, uh, if buying and maintaining a second house isn't an option, what does Doug think of uh, learning to sail? Uh, and like the South Africans, if things got bad enough, slip away in the evening by sailboat? Well, I think it's a great idea. Uh, I mean, I'm not a, I'm not a sailor, uh, but uh, owning a big sailboat that you can just take out for a cruise and keep going, I think it's a great idea. Yeah, there is a there is a little bit of freedom associated with that. You really can't find elsewhere. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense actually. Okay, not for All everybody, right. but it makes a lot of sense. All right, so uh, this is kind of a weird one, but would Doug accept the title of folk saint? What's his take on those who are not canonized or uh, beatified? Is that the word yet deserving? Uh, I think anybody that accepts a title like that is automatically suspect for being a, a folk saint. I mean, <laughs> what are they trying to build a, a cult of the personality for themselves? No, forget about it. And some people have been accepted, I think, as folk saints, like, like Che Guevara is a folk yeah. saint, you know? I mean, but but he's an active criminal. So, <laughs> yeah, I, do, I don't count the uh, average man as being a better judge of who should be a saint than I do the Pope and the Catholic Church, and they're very bad judges. A uh, perfect, perfect example would be, uh, oh, who is that Albanian nun? Mother, Mother Teresa. Teresa. Yeah. I mean, I buy Christopher Hitchens' ar 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 arguments that she was an absolutely horrible human being, but she became po popular, a folk saint, and canonized as an official saint. So yeah. that's all bullshit, in my opinion. Yeah, I definitely think anybody, especially if you're alive and you accept that uh, that title, then you're, like you said, totally disqualified. I guess that's why, you know, they yeah. wait until, for the people who, not to say anyone really, I don't, you know, is really deserves it, but uh, those who might deserve it, you have to wait till they're long gone or there's no chance they would ever accept it. Yeah, exactly. And even after they're long gone, you're probably not dealing with the reality. You're dealing with the myth, wherever that came from. Yeah, but myths have power and are useful. You know, I was, oh. you know, I've been doing a lot of Greek, uh, been studying ancient Greece with my daughter in homeschool. And right now we're reading the Iliad. And, uh, you know, these stories are great. The moral lessons in them, I think that's what's missing from education, probably more than anything else, is that just these moral lessons, you know, you, you know, these heroic figures that are mythical, you know, I, I think they're, I think it's fantastic, so. 
Like yeah, I, I agree. And actually the virtues or things that are being promoted as virtues today are actually non-virtues. It was um, on uh, NCAP radio on Twitter. I don't even know how to tell people to get on that. Uh, Giant Bandari was on it yesterday and uh, he, he was talking about the general degraded statu uh, status of the third world and third worlders. And Giant is absolutely wonderful the way he lambastes uh, third worlders in general, and Indians in particular. And uh, but how do how do people go on NCAP radio to listen to it? I yeah, the the you just go to go on Twitter and look for ancapradio.com. It's uh, or not ancap not not com, but just the handle ancap radio, and you can and I see it right now. You can listen to it there. Yeah, and you really should tune in if you're looking for a really good lesson. Listen to listen to Giant uh, talk about these things. Uh, you'll be mightily amused. Uh, oh, he's 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 unintentionally hilarious. I mean, <laughs> he really is. <laughs> I love. Him. He's just brilliant. Um, and he just because of his, you know, because of being Indian, being raised in that environment, and observing himself evolve, he has a perspective and the moral authority to really attack things that you just couldn't even, you know, you couldn't do. We couldn't do. Um, you know, we we couldn't get to the point to the to the juice of it so effectively like him. It's he's amazing. Yeah, the anecdotes of life in India that he tells are just it's fantastic. Oh, it All right, let's see. Last question for today. Doug mentioned uh, recently that you favor small 19th century European, uh, basically quarter ounce, slightly less. Uh, Aside from suggesting a website where these might be best purchased, uh, doesn't this type of coin add the question of the condition of the coin into the price, which gives the advantage to any uh, expert that might be selling them? Uh, no, condition is not an important thing because you're buying these coins, at least at the moment. I don't know what they are at this very moment, but uh, they're roughly two, three, four, five percent premium above bullion value. Condition is not a major factor. I mean, they're... Can you explain the difference between numismatics and uh, just bullion? Or Yeah, numismatics are, are coins that their value is not dependent upon the actual gold or silver they contain. It's independent. They're valued as artwork or as collectibles with only a minor, very minor relationship to the actual gold uh, or silver. Silver is not even worth thinking about uh, in them. So, uh, and uh, I was a coin collector for many years and actually like ancient Greek and Roman coins. <laughs> if you want to collect coins, instead of <laughs> collecting government slugs that all look the same and are made with industrial processes, I don't get the point of collecting modern coins, but ancient Greek and Roman coins are uh, each one-off artwork, and they're really beautiful and really interesting. Much more than you know something with a an odd mint mark or something that otherwise looks like millions of other coins that these modern governments turn out. Mm -hmm. so. And if you're, but but it's the fundam that's fundamentally different than what you're talking about. These are high circulation uh, coins from the from the from the 19th century. That's what you were referring to. Yeah, from so, Germany, Switzerland, Denmark, uh, uh, all, all of the European countries have them. Britain had the sovereign. Uh, they were used in day-to-day -day commerce. And they're not heavily worn, so don't, don't worry about that. Yeah, and you buy them because they're very low premium above their gold content, and they're uh, very small and fungible, worth roughly five bucks a piece at this point. And you can there are lots of bullion dealers online. You can buy these from. Be the where you have to be careful is if, is if they're, if they're selling collectibles. Uh, that's where you can be, you can definitely be taken advantage of. 
uh, if you don't, because they definitely have a lot of expert value. So, but you're not looking for the collectible ones. You're looking for, you know, the ones that are fungible. I mean, they're the same. Yeah, I like to see my coin dealers make money. I mean, they're in business, but don't let them upsell you to something you don't want or understand, which is some kind of collectible. You want right. the the bullion, right? And if you if you are into interested in collectibles at all, then I guess I would recommend our friend Van Simmons, because he is the expert in these things and definitely knows all about them and is fair minded and fair in dealing. Yep, he's a straight shooter. If you're going to yeah. go to, it's uh, David David Hall, Hall. David Hall com. Rare Coins, I think. Maybe DavidHall.com. Yeah. So, but you want bullion, um, not collectible coins. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Well, I think that's it for today, Doug. Let's see. There's a couple of the news items or work that I had here that worth discussing. Um, oh yeah, I have to ask you about Argentina formally requesting to join NATO as a global partner. Yes. Yeah, sometimes I wonder about Millet. I mean, you know, going to the Wailing Wall and uh, identifying as a Jew. I mean, well, at least he's not identifying as a uh, as a Mohammedan. But um, uh, meeting with Bill Clinton right after his election. Yeah, but this is crazy. Where he wants to be an honorary member of NATO. I mean, this is antithetical to uh, the whole idea of being an ANCAP, where you're going to obligate your government to get involved in somebody else's idiotic foreign war. Yeah. What do you think? What do you think is going on in his head with that? What, what, what? I don't know. Listen, almost all human beings suffer from one mental aberration or another, sometimes <laughs> serious, sometimes not so serious. The problem is when you're the head of state and you elevate your personal, you know, loose screws to a national level. That's a problem. So I'm really sorry to see him do all these things. Yeah. As president of Argentina. You know, I mean, if he wants to be, if he, if he wants to change his religion and become a Jew, that's just fine. I don't, I don't, I really don't care. But to, uh, this is crazy to, uh, try to obligate Argentina to act like it's a NATO member. That's insane, actually. Yeah, and there was also some minister on, uh, uh, I saw on Twitter was, um, there's a guy I follow on Twitter. It's, it goes by the handle of Bowtide Mara. And he's a Dutch guy who's been in Buenos Aires for about 15 years. And he, he publishes information constantly on what's happening in Argentina. Um, and... It's great. I mean, he just posted on Twitter. And so all the things, the changes in the what Malay does and, you know, firing people, public workers and, you know, all this good stuff. And he posts, you know, the stuff that's questionable, too. But he, there's a, it's a great source of information. And one thing, there was this minister who announced that they were going to start producing and selling ammunition, nine millimeter and seven six two to the U.S. And he specifically mentioned the CIA. As a customer, hmm. uh, ammunition manufactured in Argentina being sold yes. to, yeah. Hmm. Well, I'd rather see them sell it to the Argentine people at cheap prices. Exactly. Actually, hundred <laughs> percent. Well, if they ramp up production there, you know, I mean, you know, maybe some of it spill into the local economy. Yeah, hopefully, that's right. Yeah. So I don't know, we, these sort of uh, bad decisions by Millet, we we got to we got to just keep track of them and see if we see uh, patterns emerging, so we can figure out what that screw might be. I hope he's not uh, at least around the edges being corrupted or bent by whoever he's hanging around. It can happen, you know. Power corrupts. It does which is why most and it was right. It's, it's almost uh, impossible to imagine an ANCAP president, right? Because an ANCAP wouldn't, why would we have anything to do with it? Well, that's true. But in all the world, he's, he's, he's our best hope. So. Well, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully they're less inclined to let him join NATO than they are Ukraine. <laughs> that's, that's right. And anyway, 
Argentina doesn't have an army to speak of, doesn't have a navy to speak of, although this is another thing that I'm disturbed about. Uh, Malay is apparently buying F-16s. Like, yeah, for, used F-16s from uh, Denmark. Denmark. Yeah, they're 40-year-old planes. Well, f for a war plane, 40 years old, that's getting a little long in the tooth. Uh, and uh, first of all, why, why does Argentina need fighter jets? Who's it going to use them against, for God's sake? We're not going to get into a war with uh, any of the neighboring countries. I mean, it's... Yeah, it does seem like a waste of money, if nothing else. Waste of money. And, uh, wait a minute, I thought Argentina didn't have the money. Exactly. You no, know? oh, I didn't narrow. What happened to that? Now we're going to exactly. buy, buy crappy used jets from Denmark? I mean, what's going on here? Yeah, this is disturbing. Yeah, we'll have to watch for it. Okay, all right. Well, I think we'll leave it there for today, Doug. Um, and we'll be back next week with more. So have a good okay. weekend. Fantastic, Matt. You too.